uh, one that's a rectangle and then inscribed inside of it perfectly is a circle and you're throwing darts at this well the idea is that you can experimentally come up with the value of pi by looking at the ratios of the areas so for the circle with a radius of r okay we know the formula for that is pi r squared right but for the rectangle or rather it's really a square for the square that it's around it the length of the side would be 2r right because you're going to go an r and another r and another 2r out here. So the area of that would be 2r times 2r, 4r squared. So the area of one over the area of the other, if we look at the ratio, we can cancel out the r squares. And the ratio would be pi over four, but really these are two different a's. They're, they're not really the same. I'm gonna call them a1 and a2. a1 is the ratio of the area in the circle and a2 is the ratio of the area just inside the entire um, square. We can solve for pi. Pi is going to be, and if you just cross multiply the 4 and the a1 and then over a2. Now this ratio of a1 over a2 is the same as the ratio of, imagine you're throwing darts at this dartboard. It's the ratio of darts that land inside the circle divided by the dots or the sorry the the darts that land just in general on the dartboard somewhere we can do that experimentally okay so let me take this we'll put this over here so pi is going to be four times darts inside circle divided by just the total number of darts thrown. So what we'll do experimentally is we'll simulate uh, throwing a dart just by doing random X's and Y's. We'll see how many of them land inside the circle and we'll just create a ratio off of that. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and use Microsoft Excel right now. If you don't have a computer at home, oh well. That's why you're here, right? Okay, can you see Excel pretty well? Would you like me to zoom in on it? <clears throat> yeah, zoom in on it a little bit. Okay. Oh, we can zoom in too. Oh, okay. So what I'll need to do is I'll need to uh, randomly generate points. Oh, you know, I need to show you that too before I do this. If you... Um, if you just tell the computer, and here's the function, R-A-N-D, that will give you back a value between zero and one. But that's really not what I'm after because I want to have the square centered on an XY coordinate grid where the ratio, or sorry, the radius of the circle is a one, like this. So if I just say random, it's going to give me this side right here. Well, that's half as big as I need it to be. So I need to double that. But if I double that, that's actually just going to push it to the right. So to fix that, I have to subtract one and bring it back. So this command, and the reason I put emptiness inside of random is there is nothing that goes in there on the Excel is two times a random number minus one. And I think you can see that it's down here in my spreadsheet I provided you right there. That would be for X and Y you would do something like that for determining if a point is located in the circle or not, we can do that with an inequality. X squared plus Y squared is less than one. So I'm gonna treat the border, if it actually did land on the border as if it was a failure, but everything inside of the circle will be success. Really the border is not gonna matter that much because we're gonna be doing a bunch of points. So I'm gonna be putting together this 
uh, part of the spreadsheet live in front of you. So strap on your seatbelts. Is everybody okay out there? If you have any questions, just start talking. Okay, so these will be my X's and these will be my Y's. And then I want to determine, is it inside the circle or not? So this will be some, oops, two times random minus one. And remember, when we do random numbers, they're going to change every time I change the formula here. Okay, so same thing, two times random minus one. And then for if it's inside the circle or not, I'm going to say if, now my x is going to be located at a2. So if a2 squared plus y is b2 squared, if that's less than 1, then I'm going to say 1 as 1 success. Otherwise, I'm going to say 0 as 0 success. So this is just like we did that previous um, simulation. Okay, so apparently that point, negative 0.5 and 0.866, that would land outside the circle that goes centered on 0, 0, without, out with a radius of 1. Um, I think, let's see, how did you do it 50 times? All right, now I want to see how many times I was actually in the circle. So I'm going to do a sum. I know you can't see the very bottom of that, can you? Hold on. Let me just push this up a little farther. Oh, there we go. A sum from, let's see, it starts at C2 and it ends at C50. Okay, so I got 36 in that run. This is what we call the total inside points. So now, of course, it's going to change as we change the spreadsheet. Now, the ratio is it's that C51 cell divided by 50 because we did 50 points. So if it's 42, the percentage is 84. 84% of the dots landed inside. Proportion of inside points. Now, the next thing is standard error. What is standard error? I'm going to define it for you when we get to the notes section. The standard error is the standard deviation of the sample. Standard deviation of the sample. Now you're not going to get it by running a standard deviation on all those zeros and ones. What you have to do is you have to use a formula that we talked about in the last lesson. Let me see. Let me write that in here. It's the square root of P. Well, let's see. You can't see that. I'm too zoomed in. Hold on. The square root of P times 1 minus P over N. So proportion of successful inside the circle darts times proportion of unsuccessful divided by the total number of darts that we've thrown. So let me go back to the spreadsheet and we'll calculate that in. So remember this cell looks like it's C52 is containing, I have to start with the square root, C52 times one minus C52 and divided by 50 because it's fixed at 50. Okay, this is called the standard error. Let's see what else do we have to do. Um, okay, so the what lower endpoint would we get? 
uh, I'm trying to make a 95% confidence interval. So let me take you back earlier in our course. Okay, my terrible normal curve. Remember we had the 95, no, sorry, that's, I skipped to the middle number, 68, 95, 99.7 rule. And the 95 means that if you're at the center and you go out two standard deviations, call them SDs, if you go out two standard deviations on either side, then you're going to be capturing 95% of the data. Well, from our last lesson, I have 50 data points. That's going to be enough. I've got 10 successes, 10 failures at least. That's enough to say on my sampling distribution, I am going to have a normal curve. And instead of standard deviation, we're going to replace that with what we have, which is standard error. If we use standard error and see what would be the mean the mean would be the proportion that we got from our experiment we call that p with a hat it gets a hat because it comes from the sample so if we do p hat and we add two standard deviations on one side and two standard deviations on the other side we're going to come up with an interval that captures 95% of the data. And we're gonna say, we are 95% confident that the true proportion is in there. Okay, so I got a little calculating to do on this. To get my lower endpoint, I've gotta do my P hat minus two standard deviations, there's two standard errors. And to get the upper endpoint, I gotta do my P hat plus two standard deviations. Are you following this, guys? <laughs> You're awfully quiet. I think we're good. All right. So I'm going to go my proportion of inside points, which is at C52, plus two of the standard errors, which is at, no, no, I want to do the lower end point first, minus two times the standard error at C53. Okay, there's my lower end point. Then for the upper endpoint, I want to go back to C52 and this time add two standard errors, which is at C53. And there's my upper endpoint. Okay, so now we're up to the point where now how do we get the estimates for pi itself? Well, remember what I just showed you? back up here at the very beginning of the lesson, this formula, this part right here that I'm circling in blue, that is P hat. Because that's how I calculated P hat. I did the proportion of dots or darts inside and the proportion of darts outside or no. So that, that's totally wrong. The proportion of darts totally thrown. So all I really have to do with those proportions is multiply them by four and I'll be getting my estimate for pi. <laughs> so whose kids are yelling in the background? That's cute. If you want to, you can mute your uh, microphone. Or you can just let us hear the screaming kids. That's always fun. 
Okay, so I'm almost done. I'm gonna take each of those endpoints and mo multiply them by four. So four times the first one at C54. And this is our lower pi estimate. And then if I do four times the upper at C55, that's my high pi or higher pi, I guess, estimate. All right, got news for you. That's not a very good estimate because we know pi is 3.14, right? But here's the thing. What do you guys think would happen if we did more trials on this simulation? Let's say instead of doing 50, I did 5,000. What do you think would happen to our estimate? Anybody? What do you think would happen to our estimate if we did 5,000 trials instead of 50? Okay, raise your hand if you think it would get closer to the actual value of pi. Can you guys not see my screen? Ah, Brittany raised her hand. Nice job. Did you know you can electronically raise your hand in here? On Zoom, I mean. If it, was, if it were to go higher? Yeah, if we do more trials. No, it would, it would pass it. Well, remember, I've got a low estimate on one side and a higher estimate on the other. And my webcam just totally stopped working. So you guys can't see me, can you? No. No, we can't. Shoot, I'm using my cell phone because I, I didn't want my, um, I didn't want my laptop to interfere. I'm actually having a very complicated setup here. I wasn't sure it was gonna work at all. Um, this darn thing, I don't know. I spent some money for this app too. Okay, there. Can you see me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you've got a low estimate of pi on one side and a high estimate of pi on the other side. And as you do more and more trials, it comes closer and closer and closer to the actual value of pi. So how do you increase your accuracy? You would think you would just increase your confidence. Oh, I wanna be 99% confident, right? But really the statistical answer is you have to increase your number of trials to become more confident, or sorry, more accurate. So yeah, those are not so great, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and put those in on the worksheet now. So let's see, my P hat was, I'm gonna stick with 0.78. My 95% interval went from about, let's say 2.65 to 3.58. 2.58, the lower, nope, sorry, that's totally wrong. It's the decimals, it's 0.66 to point, I'm gonna round that off to 0 0.90. 0 0.66 to point, Nine zero. My low pi estimate was 2.65, 3.58. Now here's something that we're gonna miss by not being all together and having 30 people do this at the same time. If I had 30 people do this, the interpretation of a 95% interval is 
95% of you would capture the true value of pi. So think about it. You've got a low estimate, you've got a high estimate. Think of that as a net. And we know pi, but let's say we're doing something statistical where we don't know a value. It's out there somewhere, right? So we just because we create this interval doesn't mean that we absolutely know we captured it. But if we have a 95% interval, it means 95% of the time we have captured the true value. So that's why we can say we are 95% confident that the true value of pi is between 2.65 and 3.58. There could be intervals that actually don't capture the true value of pi. Um, and we have to think outside of, okay, we know what pi is. Remember, we're after values in statistics that we don't know, that are unknown to us. All right, so anyway, I know it wasn't the greatest of lessons, especially not being there in person, but do you at least get the idea of how we created the interval? <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna take that as yes. Kind of. Kind of? Okay, well, well, we're gonna go to the notes part and see if we can clear that all up, okay? All right. Zoom us out a little bit. Here we go. Okay, two things, two big ideas. We'll kind of split it like one third, two thirds. The standard error. Zoom in a little bit. Standard error. We'll abbreviate it SE, is the standard deviation of a sample. Now, specifically, we've been talking about proportions. There's really two kinds of standard errors that we talk about. I know my camera just went out. Oh, well, I'm just going to have to leave it. The standard error of a mean and the standard deviation are standard error of a proportion. So the one that we were using for proportions is the square root of p, 1 minus p over n. You might recognize that formula from our last um, lesson because that was the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. There's a connection between the two. OK, so then the other big idea is creating the 95% confidence interval. So I'm just going to remind you that p hat is the proportion, or you can think of proportion as percentage if you'd like. Percentage from a sample. So p hat plus or minus two standard errors, or written as an interval notation, p hat minus two SEs and P hat plus two SEs.
Now, question that I would be wondering if I were you is, what if I didn't want to be 95% confident? What if I wanted to just be 90% confident? Or what if I wanted to be 50% confident? Well, what that would do is that would change the number we put here. And that is a future exploration we're going to do. How do we change the percentage of confidence? But for right now, you get a word problem. First thing you need to do is say, what's my proportion from the sample? Second thing, I'm probably going to need to calculate my standard error. To calculate my standard error, I'm going to need to know how many trials or how many people. So your assignment is to do the application. One thing that I noticed was just a little bit tricky in the application is that this 2002 number is not a year. That's the N. <clears throat> so they give you enough information with the 71%. You can calculate the standard error and then create an interval. Remember, that's the ending product. I want to create an interval. And then on number two, now we're going to shrink the number of people who participated, think about what that would do to our estimates. Are we gonna get better estimates or worse estimates? I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? We always say, if you can, more is better. So actually calculate the new interval. You'll have to go out to three decimal places on that to really see a difference. Um, but I don't think that this is too, too hard. One last thing I want to leave you with um, before you have any questions for me or we'll end it is how do you answer these kind of questions? There's a format you always answer them in. You say, we are blank percent confident that, and then here you put in some context. In other words, what are you talking about is in the interval and then stated in interval notation like this. And that's how you answer every one of those. Normally in class, will I don't know. What's that? Will this be mandatory or will this just be if you want to come on here and look at the notes? Look at you doing the notes or? Um, you mean, is watching the video mandatory? Yeah, like coming on Zoom and being part of the group chat. Uh, no, I, I just thought if from your perspective, it might be a better experience because it could be more interactive. Okay. Um, like I said, I'm just I'm gonna repost the video on YouTube and then I'll I'll put the link in the Google Classroom. So